This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. I swear to God, computers, they just absolutely suck. Um, All kinds of trouble uh, getting started here, but uh, I think we got it, uh, I think we got it worked out. Uh, I can see the volumes are going haywire, though. (laughs) See if I can't calm it down here just a tad. I'm I'm not quite sure why that's, uh, why that's going on uh, like it is, but uh, let me see if I can't fix that. I think Aaron finally made it back. I did. Yep, I'm here. All right. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what's going on with that. I have no idea how this is even going to sound going out. Uh, volumes were all whacked out of shape and and everything, but hey, you know, uh, computers just suck sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. Well, Hopefully it turns out okay. Well, and you know, the funny thing about it is, I mean, I, you know, when I'm done broadcasting, I turn everything off, shut everything down, and I go on about my business. Nothing changes until the next time, you know, we fire up. And it's just a hit or a miss, you know, where everything's going to start up correctly. And, uh, you know, I guess it just depends on how you hold your tongue or something. I don't know. Anyway, we're back. Um, I I do have to say, um, our vacuum cleaner quit the other day. And so, I actually quit about a week and a half ago. And uh, so, my wife wanted, did I I already tell you guys about this vacuum cleaner that we got? I don't think so. This is is like, I've just... You know, I just, I'm still, well, let me, let me tell you what happened. Okay, so the vacuum cleaner quits. And, uh, you know, it's probably 20 years old. And so, you know, the wife, she wants to go out and get a new vacuum cleaner. No problem. She's going to go to Sears and, and, you know, pick one up. And I said, well, don't, don't get one of those, you know, $99 deals. They just, you know, get, get a decent vacuum cleaner. And so she comes home with this box, and it's one of these funky thing with the big ball thing. Oh. And yeah, so, yeah. Okay, okay, are you ready for this? She hands, she hands me the receipt for this vacuum cleaner. Now, mind you, this is, this is something that gets used maybe once a week. Okay, uh, and goes back into the closet and sits there quietly and does nothing but suck dirt from the carpet. Okay, seven hundred dollars. Oh my god! Okay, seven hundred dollars. <laughs> well, you told her not to get the bill. <laughs> <laughs> you think? I mean, holy cow! And I'm sitting there thinking, my God, that's like, I could buy three fermenters for that kind of money. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, wow. But, but this thing, I mean, you know, this $700 vacuum cleaner, I mean, it will suck the paint off the wall. I mean, it's, 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 pow- it's the most powerful freaking vacuum cleaner I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Pretty heavy deal, but- you remember the old rainbows that you put water in, and when you vacuumed, all you had was a big pot of mud? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, those were god-awful. Yeah, hey, when I was a kid, we used to have one that that was attached to this, uh, well, it was one of them pull-around canister deals uh, that my mom had. And uh, if you tug too hard on it, you know, the, the thing would, like, spring forward and hit you in the legs. And uh, mm-hmm. But, 
So anyway. Something where you're like dragging part of it behind you as you go type of a thing. Yeah. Gotcha. So, but, uh, so anyway, I, I get to vacuum. I mean, I'm, I'm the one that does all the vacuuming anyway. So now I get to drive this Porsche around the house that, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's freaking unreal. But anyway, well, welcome to the Mead house. I think we got things already fixed here. Uh, volumes are looking pretty good. We already got some listeners. Glad you're along for the ride. Jeff uh, is not with us tonight. He's taking the night off. But I did get an email from him uh, earlier. He, uh, You know, we've been talking about braggots and stuff, so we're going to share that here a little bit later on. I do have a few shout-outs to, uh, uh, to holler out of people. But in the meantime, uh, again, welcome to the Mead House. Uh, we're live every Tuesday night uh, right here at themeadhouse.com. Uh, you can get us on TuneIn Radio. You can also get the replays uh, at themeathouse.com. We're listed on Stitcher Radio, iTunes, and, and various places. And I think uh, we might even be good to go on Google now. I have no idea. I haven't even looked. But uh, Facebook, uh, you can give us a holler on Facebook. Just uh, simply go to The Mead House uh, in your little search deal on the Facebook. Uh, we're not even going to do the Twitter thing. And if you, uh, if you get absolutely bored to death listening to the show and you really got to chime in and, and bring us back to the table, 818-921-4680 uh, if you want to wake us all up. And uh, we'll talk about anything that you want to talk about so long as it's about mead. <laughs> um, Aaron Martin in the house, Mississippi Chris is with us tonight, and uh, I imagine we probably caught Chris at dinner time again. So I don't even know if I even want to ask him what he's drinking. Sweet tea, more than likely. But let's go ahead and start that off, Chris. Uh, tell me, it's sweet tea. It's not sweet tea. I'll be damned. Uh, it's a. I <laughs> uh, got a traditional uh, sunflower blossom honey from Aaron. Hmm. Oh, yep. Oh, oh. You and mean our very own Aaron? Our very own Aaron. It's uh, <laughs> one of his varietal uh, experiments that he did. Um, it needs a little age. Uh, other than that, there's some there's some good stuff happening in there. Awesome. Yeah, uh, lots of good stuff. I'm, I'm drinking it at room temperature. Uh, normally, I drink needs a little bit chilled. So um, I think maybe some of the flavors that I'm tasting that I think maybe age would help probably wouldn't be there if it was where I normally drink it. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so it's good stuff. Well, I've heard, um, I, I think I ran across something, or maybe we talked about it on the show, where uh, people are, I guess, they're starting to drink mead at room temperature now for some reason. I guess they get more of the... Like you say, the, the you know the varietal characters and whatnot come out more uh, more prevalent. So uh, yeah, if you've got a if you've got an absolutely perfect perfect mead, which is hard to do, uh, room temperature is the way to go. Uh, but you know we all have our flaws, and uh, uh, Lord knows everything I make has its flaws. So I stick it in the refrigerator, and it hides a lot of sins. Yeah, you're going to be drinking mine ice cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, yeah, I guess my box from uh, Aaron is supposed to arrive sometime this week. Uh, apparently, they had to stop and feed the horses. You know how Pony Express goes. But, uh, Aaron, what's in your glass tonight? Well, tonight I am pol polishing off a bottle of Melavino's Tempted to Touch. This is Sergio's... Sweet yeah. mead that has the, the cocoa nibs and vanilla beans. Um, definitely a, a really fantastic mead. It, it kind of reminds me of his coffee mead that, that I tried, you know, maybe a month or two ago. Um, just a, a really nice, smooth base mead and, and really like the, the coffee or the um, chocolate and vanilla flavors that are coming through as well. Yeah, I remember that, uh, you know, uh, that batch that he sent us here a while back. Um, I thought that was pretty good tasting stuff too myself. Um, 
and I've just, I just, I've absolutely given up on the coffee thing. I mean, you guys will be getting the coffee thing as soon as mine's done here in a few more weeks, hopefully. But but you're dumping uh, it on us. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the coffee. <laughs> Uh, I just, you know, you I know, think the uh, I think the tempted to touch was my favorite of all those he sent. Actually. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. 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 Well, I've I, got one left. What was it? The Midnight Jack, I want to say, which is the one with um, like tart cherries and and just some of those dark, dark fruits going on. I've yeah. been saving that one for last, so definitely excited to to crack that one open here. God, you're a slow drinker. <laughs> <laughs> I finished mine a long time ago. Yeah, I've been I've been uh, holding out, just saving them. <laughs> well, I'm drinking uh, I'm drinking a sweet mead tonight. This is a rabbit's foot meadery. Uh, I found this bottle at uh, at my Bevmo here locally, and uh, so I picked it up. I don't believe I've had I've had some rabbit's foot mead, but I don't believe I've had their sweet mead. Um. I don't. I don't quite know what to think of it yet. Uh, I need to. I need to drink some more. But it's definitely sweet. Um, I mean, it absolutely smells like honey. Uh, I couldn't tell you what, and I don't have my other glasses on to see the label that clearly to know if they put the variety on there or not. But um, I mean, it's, it's. I'm drinking it ice cold. I mean, it's it's good cold. Uh, it's, it, it is sweet. Uh, about a half a glass is all I'm going to be able to manage of this tonight. But uh, it, you know, it's, it's fairly decent. I'm, you know, uh, if you're into sweet meads, this would make a fine little dessert uh, after dinner type thing. I think. Um, but I, I, just in case, I do have a bottle of Scuppernog sitting here. This is a wine, that, uh, Muscadine wine from North Carolina that we brought back. So. Uh, I thought, just in case I didn't like this rabbit's foot mead, why I better put another bottle of something on the desk. So, <laughs> yeah, um, there you go. We, uh, I, I did manage to get around uh, today, and um, kind of a busy day here. Spent uh, doing some uh, household chores here, uh, and, and I don't know where you live, but where I live, it's been like in the hundreds again. And so wandering outside, it just uh, uh, you, you just you just I just don't do that. I just try to stay inside. So keeping myself busy doing the manly uh, house chores uh, that I do every week. So um, I did manage to get around in between uh, driving the vacuum from room to room uh, to the Facebook deal. I want to throw a shout out to Patricia Gwen Edwards. Uh, this comes from the Mead Makers Facebook group. Uh, she's uh, into doing braggots, too. She's got one going now. And uh, she uh, uh, she's doing, uh, I don't think it says what yeast she's using. She's using some kind of an ale yeast in this thing. It's uh, 51% honey, apparently. Uh, and it's a... Uh, I guess it's, uh, she calls it a French honey beer, uh, farmhouse ale. Uh, she doesn't really go into a, a list of the ingredients, but I just wanted to throw her a shout out. We've been kind of communicating. She's, she's been, she's an avid listener and, um, she can't listen live apparently, but she listens, she always listens the day after the show. So she'll be listening tomorrow. And uh, she's she's very much into doing braggots. So in this particular one she's doing is getting ready, I guess, for a, a competition that uh, she intends to enter with it. So wishing uh, Patricia Gwen Edwards lots of luck there. Let us know how it turns out. And uh, uh, keep us informed uh, here on the show. And, uh, you know, we'd be glad to uh, let everybody know how you did. Um you know, last week uh, I mentioned, uh, well, it might have even been a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I was doing this peach mead, and I think we might have talked about it on the show. I have, um, I caught up with uh, William Francis. Now, I'm probably going to butcher your last name, William, uh, but I'm going to call it Reed, uh, W-R-E-D-E. 
Um, this is, uh, I believe it was on Mead Makers, if I'm not mistaken. I, I forgot to put the, uh, uh, I don't know, it might have been uh, a wine enthusiast, come to think of it, but Mead and wine enthusiast, I believe. But uh, anyway, William Francis Reed, uh, he started a peach also, uh, and he's also using wildflower, but he's doing his quite a bit different than I did. He's putting uh, 15 pounds of peaches in primary and looks like 15 in secondary and um, adding some vanilla bean and some lemon zest uh, in secondary. Now, he blanched his peaches and peeled them, and he's only using half the skins in secondary. So I thought that was a pretty unique way uh, to... Uh, uh, you know, to make a peach mead as well. So uh, uh, good luck with your mead there, uh, William. Let us know how it turns out. Anxious to uh, hear about it. And, uh, you know, if you're able, uh, call us on the show. Or, uh, we'd be glad to have you have you uh, uh, on Skype or whatever, however we can get uh, get you on the show. But I uh, would like for you to come in and, and uh, talk about your peach mead if you can. He's using 71B yeast, by the way. So, uh, yeah, um, that out of the way, my peach mead uh, so far, well, we'll save that for the hopper list later on in the show. Um, n no new developments, really, but uh, it's coming along. But uh, we'll talk about it here a little bit later on. Um, you know, I was so busy doing stuff today, and I, I really didn't even feel like getting that involved with the show, because I wanted this to be off the cuff, open forum, free-for-all night. Uh, so I put very little in the show notes. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit more about the Braggot So Aaron. I don't know if you saw that recipe that, um, uh, that Jeff had sent us. Uh, I sure did. Yeah, what do you think about that? You know, it looks like a, a really tasty one to me. So um, this is a recipe that Jeff sent out, and it's based off of a Saison beer style, which is a, a little bit lighter bodied, lighter colored type of a beer style um, with some kind of like estuary notes that you get from the yeast and... It's a really solid, solid beer style. Um, definitely this time of year, J.D., you're talking about the 100-degree temperatures out there. I think a, a Saison would be a good one to cool you off out there. Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can get this pulled up here to, to take a look at what he has going on. Um, so he's got five pounds of a light dried malt extract, one pound of a Belgian Pilsner malt, one pound of a white wheat malt, I'm thinking that those may be what he's going to be using as his specialty grains to, to kind of steep a little bit before he adds in the malt extract. Um, then roughly eight pounds of honey, enough to get you up to, what does he say, a starting gravity of, I, I want to say it was like a 1.09 or 1.092 type of a range. Um, and then he has like a, a French Saison yeast, the Y yeast 3711. Uh, so, looks like a, a definitely an interesting recipe. Oh, and then lastly, he's got some mosaic hops as well, uh, which I was doing a little bit of research about before the show. Um, definitely, that sounds like a, a pretty interesting hop to me. Um, I've not used mosaic hops before, but looking at some of the descriptors here, you know, it looks like a nice dual purpose hop that, that maybe you could use for some some bittering as well as, you know, flavor or aroma. Um, and just some, some really interesting, like, citrus, pine, herbs, mint, blueberry, like all, all different kinds of flavors that you can get from, from this hop, kind of depending on, on how you use it. So definitely yeah. an intriguing recipe that he's got put together here. Yeah, and we're going uh, gonna to put this up on the website. Now, he... Uh he says that th this is a this is an off the cuff something that he put together. Uh, he's never done this before, so untested. You know, yep. If the, if there are any expectations out, uh, 
just set that aside because uh, he has no idea uh, how this is going to turn out. But, I mean, looking over this recipe, Chris, I think you got the recipe, too. If you haven't had I a chance. I was just looking over it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't see anything here that's really that far out of line. Of course, not knowing a whole lot about making beer, but uh, what, what's your thought? Well, you're doing a, you're doing a mash. Uh, steep in the grains, then you strain that off and you put it into your boil. And, uh, you know, my limited knowledge of beer brewing, that's, that's pretty much how it's done. Yeah. And, and when I say limited, I stress limited. Um, so it, it's looking like he's doing a, he's not using a, um, uh, an extract or anything. It's all grain. Brewing here, pretty much. Well, you're using a dry malt extract. That's going to be in powder form, right, Aaron? That's yeah, he's going to... Correct. Yeah. But he is still doing a mash, though, with the, with the grains, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um... Now he's uh, he's also included all all the steps. Uh, you know, I mean, he he's methodically planned this out, which is good. Um, and uh, you know, it takes he takes you all the way through the boil uh, and everything. I, I don't want to again go into all, all of the uh, you know complete specifics. We'll put this up on the website and on the uh, Facebook page, but. Um, I'm not seeing anything here. I, I don't know what mosaic. Can, can you speak to the mosaic hops, Aaron, at all? Yeah. So the the mosaic hops, looking at the bitterness level, they look like they're definitely on the high level in terms of the alpha acids. And as I think Jeff alluded to last week, the alpha acid is is kind of the the typical measuring stick for hops to determine, you know, how intense of a bitterness or how intense of a bittering character you're going to get. Um, so to, to give a little bit of a scale here, you know, hops that are between the 3 to 7% range are going to be in kind of that low to medium bitterness range. 8 to 12 and above is going to be kind of that medium to high bitterness. And the mosaic, it just says on, on this website I'm looking at, over 10%. So definitely high on, on the bitterness level, which would probably make it a, a good candidate for the bittering hop, which, you know, you would incorporate for the full um, 60 minutes of, of the boil. And that's not to say you couldn't add some, you know, towards the end of the boil as well to give you some of the, the flavor and aroma characteristics as well, um, which might be really nice. Just, to, again, reading through some of the descriptors, the, the flavor descriptors, of this hop, you know, things like citrus and pine, earthy, herbal, mint, bubblegum, blueberry, you know, some of these types of flavors, just a lot of different types of flavors going on with this hop. Um, I haven't personally had any experience with, with the mosaic hop, um, but after reading a little bit about it, it definitely looks like a, an interesting one to experiment with. Yeah. Yeah, and he talk uh, a little bit about the uh, the esters from that that sign yeast. Also, that's a uh, from what I've heard, that's a very interesting profile that comes from that type of yeast. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think with with the saison yeast, you're going to get maybe some spicy or peppery even like an earthy type of, of flavor that, that the yeast will put off. Um, one of the other things that was interesting reading his recipe is that at, even at warmer temperatures, you know, greater than 75 degrees, you can get some of those esters that are favorable and kind of desirable characteristics that you would want, especially with this style. Um, you know, Saisons definitely have just a very distinct bite to them for anyone that's that's ever had one. Um, you know, it's it's definitely that, a very distinctive that known as the, Isn't that what's sort of known as the farmhouse style? Uh, yep, beer? I, think I, yeah. I think I have heard it described that way. Yeah, I think so. Farmhouse ale, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking this uh, mead from Aaron, and this it's got a beer quality to it. It's not strong, but it's got some kind of a beer quality. Interesting. Uh, yeah, Is I don't know where that's coming from. No, it's not no. carbonated. It's but it, it's got a beer like uh, quality to it. It's sort of the more you drink it, and maybe it's because it's drier than what I'm used to. You know, as I recall the whole process I went through with these honey varietals, I actually started out with an ale yeast, the Cephal US05, and pretty much had a failure to launch there. So so repitched with the D47, um, and after that, it, I mean, it just took off like a rocket. But I, like some of my, I remember the cranberry one was at least very sluggishly starting to go when I added the D47. I, I think the sunflower just was sitting there not doing much of anything, but I, I wonder if that has anything to do with some of the beer characteristics that you're getting there. I think um, I think Jeff's on to something here. Uh, this really looks like something that uh, is worthy of trying. I know... Uh, uh, he was. Uh, he said he was getting a little bored and didn't have anything started. And I think I kind of alluded to that last week. And uh, in one of the emails that I got from him, he said that uh, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He had to get something going. <laughs> so uh, too many empty fermenters, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, but this sounds. Uh, this sounds like a, a, a something doable. Um, you know, he's got uh, this one tablespoon of Irish or teaspoon of Irish moss, and I had forgotten uh, what that was. Trying to think, of what kind of flavor does that give? But then I was reminded that that is a clearing agent, actually. Uh, yeah, does the same thing as those. Uh, I think they call it wool flock uh, tablets. Uh, that mm -hmm. go in, so that's that's really a no-brainer. I mean, I suppose you could use that in place of Irish moss if you couldn't get your hands on Irish moss. But uh, um, this uh, this looks pretty good. Uh, I, I would be anxious to try this one out and uh, and see how it does. Um, you know, we were talking last show about you know starting to get into beers and braggots and mixing the, you know, mixing the two, uh, you know, mead and beer, um, and talking about, uh, you know, all the, all the different ingredients. Uh, I suppose, I mean, if you wanted to stay, and this is the one thing that I really, this whole thing is the fact that you don't have to stay within the confines of the style itself. Now, if you're going to submit your, your, Need for competition, and you pretty much got to stick to, you know, the rules surrounding each one of those styles. But who's to say, uh, you know, like, like uh, just recipe? Why couldn't you up the DME, lower the honey, uh, so you don't have fifty percent honey? You know, uh, you know, uh, who's to say sure, you have I mean, to have? Yeah. Well, wherever you want, want some different you want, it, you want to take it more to the beer side or more to the mead side? Well, you know, I'm thinking uh, from my own personal preference, I'm thinking more to the beer side. Uh, I want something more beer-like, but I want the some of the characters of mead, uh, you know, to be... You know, and I, you know, I mean, we talked about, you know, I mean, just uh, coming up with a, a beer recipe. I mean, if, if I if I got a beer kit from Northern Brewer or More Beer or whatever, and just for the hell of it, uh, threw in a couple of quarts of honey, you know, uh, come off the boil, add a couple of quarts of honey to it, 
You know, yeah, it's going to take the the gravity up, uh, you know, a couple of notches. But uh, at that point, I mean, who who really cares at that point? Uh, you know, just to see, uh, you know, what the outcome would be. And I'm not, you know, not trying to qualify this as a braggart by any stretch of the matter. But, you know, uh, it's just the addition of honey to a beer recipe. Just to, you know, I've read about people, you know, guys who do who who brew beer, adding honey in uh, during fermentation. So uh, I'm just curious. Well, you know what? It. Everyone everyone knows I'm a mellow mel guy. Yeah. So, uh, and I've already said that my knowledge of braggots is, is close to zero. So when I start thinking about that, uh, I naturally take my scientific approach and I start drawing on what I do know which is melomels, and knowing how important balance is. Mm-hmm. Also knowing how certain flavors can can overpower certain honeys very easily. So when I start thinking about making a braggot, the first thing I think about is uh, naturally how much honey do, am I going to put in. And since I don't know, uh, then I would start looking toward things like the... Uh, the, the uh, flavors that the malt is going to give it, how strong are they, uh, what is the overall style of the beer base, uh, how strong are the hops, how bitter are the hops, uh, and how strong is the honey. So yeah. uh, then I start thinking about how do I bring all this into balance so that the honey, uh, do, it, do I want to taste honey? If I want to taste honey, then I, then I have to, consider all this stuff and think, is there something here that's going to completely overpower it? Um, So, you know, then I start digging into it and I get confused and I give up and I never make a bracket. So, (laughs) uh, uh, but I guess the time has come to figure it all out. And uh, so anything that I say about brackets, uh, if you're listening, don't take my word as gospel because it's far from it. Yeah, well, me too. I mean, I, you know, uh, this whole beer brewing experience for me is, is, you know, I mean, I've just got that one under my belt so far. And I mean, as much as I would call it a success, I'm not 100% pleased with it. I think I can do better. And I think that just comes down to fine tuning some of the ingredients, leaving some out, uh, like, like pumpkin. I mean, pumpkin. I really don't see the point in pumpkin. I really don't. Uh, and I would even I would even go so far as saying, you know what? If you're making a pumpkin mead, leave the pumpkin out. Just use the pumpkin pie spices because that's actually what you taste. Uh, yeah. The the pumpkin did absolutely nothing for the beer at all as far as flavor goes. It just added a degree of creaminess uh, almost to the taste, and I'm sure that would probably uh you know might even be the same for the mead too i I suppose but i think there's probably some saccharides and and things in there that are being released that are going to add to mouthfeel and creaminess yeah Um, so yeah there's probably something that you may not realize is there until it's not there well and this is you know, this goes back to tasting the ingredients. Now, I, I try to make it a habit to taste everything that goes in. I want to know, you know, what it's going to taste like. Uh, you know, for instance, the malt, the, you know, I stuck my finger in the empty bag of malt and, and, you know, took a couple of licks. And that's about all you'd want to do. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want to, I wouldn't put a spoonful in your mouth. Uh, Not quite as pleasant as honey. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Does have a sweetness. But better than hops. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I made that same mistake also that, that we were talking about last week. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, take it uh, from yep. us. Take it from us. Even though we're we're not beer experts, don't chew on hops. That's just not. You really don't want to do that. That's uh, not what you do. Yeah. Uh, I would have a pocket full of Rolaids uh, if you think you want to do something like that handy. But uh, <laughs> um, so this uh, so this Braggot beer thing, um, 
you know, again, I mean, tasting the ingredients, uh, I, I think it's a pretty important aspect. The one thing I like about this recipe is he's using all these light, uh, almost like a Pilsner lager type uh, beer almost, uh, white wheat malt, uh, Belgian Pilsner. I've had Belgian Pilsners here. I like them. Uh, I like Pilsners in general. I like lagers in general. So, and then he's using this, uh, you know, five pounds of light uh, uh, malt extract. Um, so, uh, I can see this is going to be kind of a light colored uh, uh, mead. Uh, but I guess it, yeah. uh, I guess it all kind of boils down to the hops too. Uh, now, he's got them split up into two one-ounce additions, one at, I want to say 40 minutes. I'm looking. Yeah, one at, looks like one at 40 minutes, and then one at... one in, Another one after 40 minutes uh, and boiling for the remaining 20? 20, yeah, there you go. We got one at 40 minutes and one at uh, 20 minutes. Or to add twenty yeah. minutes later, so. Um, so that's forty minutes left on the boil, and twenty minutes left on the boil. Yeah. yeah. Or is it the the other way around? So the first ounce would go in <laughs> for forty minutes, and then the second one would go in for the remaining twenty. So the first ounce you, boils for the inverse. Six. If you take the inverse of the multiple. <laughs> And then the, uh, carry, carry the zero. Oh, uh, and, and, yes, and the, the reverse average. Jeff. Yes. The remainder. If you're yeah. listening, Jeff, call the show or send me a quick <laughs> email, will you? We need help. <laughs> I see, you know, I see this on other people's recipes, too. Uh, add this, at, you know, at 40 minutes, add this. Okay, is that 40 minutes in or is that... 40 minutes left, you know. <laughs> uh, I got a game plan. I say we let Jeff make it and send us all bottles of it. Yeah, there you go. And that's the easy way to do it. And then if we like it, we can order more from him. There you go. There you uh, go. It's, uh, you know, yeah, because we talked about them on the last show that we were going to do three different braggots. Uh We were just going to go ahead and order kits from, uh, you know, whatever source beer kits and then uh, do our honey addition uh, to it um, so uh, I mean let, let's talk about that for a minute uh, so if we get one of these beer kits typically it's you know coming with a specific gravity in mind uh, give or take a few points uh, so are we talking about on top of the malt extract adding the honey, or are we talking about taking however many poundage, uh, I mean, if it, you know, if it comes out to three pounds of, of if it, let's say if it comes out to six pounds of, of malt, you know, either dry or liquid malt extract, and uh, we want to put uh, three pounds of honey in, do we take three pounds of malt extract out and replace that with the honey? Is that how, the, is that how we're working this, or... Uh, I'd say no. I'd say pile it in on top of it. Put it in on top. Get the uh, yeah. gravity. I'll take the gravity. Yeah, up. If, you, if you lose your DME, you're losing a lot of your your beer quality. True. Yeah. So, so I say I say kick the gravity on up and let's uh, let's kick it through the roof and do it right. Okay. The only thing I would let's make some maybe. alcohol. <laughs> they drink a lot in Mississippi, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to do on a hot day. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, no. The the only thing I was going to say is, um, you know, I, I noticed so so Jeff's recipe calls out for this, you know, Y yeast. It's an ale yeast, and with a lot of ale yeasts, once you get up above a certain gravity, just Pitching in directly like a smack pack or um, I know I've used like the white labs vials of liquid yeast. Um, you know, when, when you start getting above those certain gravity levels, 
the alienists don't always handle that very well. And one of the, the recommendations for really improving the quality of your homebrewed beer, especially for higher gravity beers, would be to make a yeast starter where essentially, you know, you, you start off with maybe some, some boiled malt extract, you add some yeast in and kind of build that colony of yeast up prior to pitching it into your wort. Um, so, so in that case where, you know, rather than just replacing half of your malt extract with honey and, um, you know, having a, a lower gravity, you know, if we're, if we're going to go down this road of increasing that starting gravity up, which I'm all for, by the way, um, it, it may be worthwhile to have a yeast starter. Mm-hmm. And two other, options, two other options as well. Uh, the second option would be to, to pick a yeast that fits in the style we're doing but will handle a higher gravity. And the other option would be step feeding. True. Step feeding, step feeding the yeast? No, so step feeding the honey in. We could, instead oh, of putting yeah. all the honey in up front, we could just, uh, yeah. you know, let it get a good start and, and step feed up. So yeah, after a yeah. few days, throw in some honey. Yeah. Well, and then even so another if option. We were going to use, yeah, if we were going to use eight pounds, we could put, say, three pounds in to start. And once the gravity drops, put another couple of pounds in and, yeah. uh, you know, do it that way. Very true. The, uh, well, I mean, how, how significant, I mean, we're not talking, uh, I mean, you know, we're not talking 20 pounds of honey here, obviously. Uh, because I'm still, I still, I, I don't want this to come out more on the sweet side. I want this to come out more on the dry side, more beer-like. Uh, so, uh, I mean, how much are we talking, you know, honey versus malt extract? So, uh, well, the the one bracket that I did make the the red Irish ale was six pounds of DME, and uh, I think it was eight pounds of honey. Okay. Uh, that was a five-gallon batch? That was a five-gallon batch, yep. Okay. So I, I'd have to look back on it. I'm almost certain it was eight pounds of honey. I know for a fact it was six pounds of DME. So you were right probably you you were probably at uh, what uh, zero ninety seven zero or not no not even that high probably probably zero fifty seven yeah but before you put the honey in uh, you're probably somewhere in the neighborhood of oh five five oh five seven somewhere in there probably so yeah I'd and have then, to look at my logbook I've got it written down. Uh, and eight pounds of honey on top of that, I mean, I guess, probably 100, maybe not even that, maybe. Uh, I 80. think it was about 1092 or something like that was the starting. Uh, you think that's too high for a uh, for like an 05 or an 04, Aaron? What was that again? You said it was 1092. Uh, one point, it, you know, it's maybe just right in that range. Do you know what yeast you used? Uh, I used the uh, the red Irish ale yeast, and that seemed to work out okay. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the one I used uh, was maybe the White Labs. No, no, I used the uh, Y yeast Smack Pack. I think. Okay. Uh, the Irish ale. Uh, Gosh, let me just get my book and I'll tell you. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm all for uh, using an ale yeast, you know, a regular beer yeast, ale yeast. So, mm-hmm. uh, let's see. Let me find it here. I've got my log book. That was a long know. time ago, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay, know. Um, go. go ahead. Okay, I used White Labs, Irish ale yeast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
so that would be the one that comes in the little vial, little piss tube. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I used on that one. Six pounds like of those. DME. Uh, I used six pounds of dark DME. I used eight pounds of uh, blackberry blossom honey. And I used, uh, now, I split my notes up here for some reason. Why in the hell did I do that? <laughs> this is why you need to be organized, people. Well, <laughs> okay, I used, uh, uh, I used uh, one and a half ounces of pellet Chinook hops um, at 60 minutes left, uh, uh, right at the beginning. That gave 50 IBUs. I used a half an ounce of uh, Chinook hop pellets um, with uh, 20 minutes left on the boil. That that gave another 10 IBUs. And then at the end, uh, with five minutes left on the boil, I put in 2.1 ounces of East Kent Golding pellet hops. Okay. And, um, well, here I've got marked out. Okay, I used 10 pounds of blackberry honey. Uh, I marked out eight and put 10. So I used uh, two three-pound bags of dark DME, 10 pounds of blackberry blossom honey. Um, I did uh, a three-gallon boil volume with uh, 65 total D uh, IBUs of Chinook and East Kent Goldings and um, Irish ale yeast, white labs. I fermented in a bucket at uh, approximately 70 degrees, and I can't carbonated. Um, I have um, some notes here that say uh, you can either use Chinook or Aroica hops uh, for the first two editions, and then if you don't want to use the East Kent Goldings, you can use either Cascade or Centennial. With five minutes left on the boil, so I had some options written down here. Uh, three gallon boil made it up to a five and a half gallon batch size, which got racked into a five gallon carboy. Uh, yep. So um, my final any... gravity. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just going to ask what your gravity numbers were. Yeah, the uh, the original gravity with with the uh, dry malt extract only was ten forty eight. Okay. Um, and then after the honey addition, I've got uh, ten ninety eight. Okay. So I, I was sitting at ten ninety eight. And my final gravity turned out to be 1.013. Okay. Interesting. So it really yeah. chewed through some of those sugars. Yeah, it, it, it ended up, um, and, I, and I kegged it, um, put it in a corny keg and, and force carved it to... Uh, Oh, let's see. What did I do here? Three volumes, I think. Yeah, I carved it to three volumes. Yeah. So, uh, turned out pretty good for my first one. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I mean, you know, you've got that under your belt. Um, what, uh, Go over, go over your hops again. Why, you, you, why, was there a particular reason why you changed, or why you decided on on that particular hops that you used? Or that was Ken Tram said to do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Tram told me to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. that that's the truth. He, that's what he said. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> 
for the first two editions, the first edition is at 60 minutes. And that was one and a half ounces of, of Chinook pellets. Uh, you could also use uh, Eroica hops there. Okay. And you're shooting for 50 IBUs. So there's this little chart that you can look up um, and some kind of little formula that I looked up to convert IBUs to figure out how many ounces. Um, and it came out to 1.5 ounces of pellets or 1.7 ounces if you're using whole leaf hops. And that's at, that's at the very beginning of the boil. And that's for Chinook. Now, I, I added another half ounce of pellets of Chinook uh, with 20 minutes left on the boil. And that was for, that added another 10 IBUs. And then when there was five minutes left on the bull, I added 2.1 ounces of East Kent Golding pellets. Okay. And uh, that was it. So your options here for hops are, if you don't want to use the Chinook for the first two editions, you can use a Royka. Uh, for that last edition at five minutes, you can use East Kent Goldings, you can use Cascade or Centennial. Yeah. And, uh, that's it. So you boil that for 60 minutes with those additions, uh, with, uh, six pounds of dark DME. Uh, then, uh, as it begins to cool down some, um, start dissolving in 10 pounds of blackberry blossom honey after the boil, and then you uh, cool it down and add, put it in your uh, fermenter and add the add the water up to uh, five and a half gallons. Yeah. Um, and then you ferment with uh, White Labs Irish Ale yeast around 70 degrees, and uh, once it's finished, rack it, let it clear, and then uh, force carve it. And you had um, what uh, you you said you used uh, blackberry honey, right? Blackberry blossom honey, yeah. Yeah. Was there any? What what, what did any? Uh, if any, what did that add to the to the final product? Or could you tell? I, I don't know because you're you're asking me about something I made like uh, four years ago. So okay. <laughs> uh, right. there's been a lot of alcohol consumed since then. <laughs> <laughs> Both homemade and other, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, of all sorts and a lot of different flavors. I could not tell you because I don't have any tasting notes written down. But I do remember, because it was the only braggot that I ever made, uh, I do remember being very pleased that it came out as well as it did. So, so I mean, uh, like, yeah, it sounds like something that you would do again then, for sure. Yes, and, and, and you have to remember, uh, this was done at a time when I did not really realize the importance of temperature control and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. uh and I didn't have my nutrient schedules fine-tuned like I do now. So with with those two factors alone, I think I could make this much better now than I did then. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd make it again. Well, uh, yeah, I think the next step for me, uh, I, I think what I would have to do, guys, is is – go through all the different hop varieties and, you know, figure out, uh, you know, if I can discern, you know, what, what they add, what kind of flavors they add, uh, to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the batch, you know, um, mm-hmm. Definitely. Even after even after making this pumpkin thing, I mean, you know, I it had uh, I put the cascade hops in. I think one was one was immediate, right at right at the beginning of the boil. The other one was the last five minutes, I believe. 
one, uh, let's see, an ounce and a half up front, a half an ounce in the end. I have no clue. I mean, I, I understand the hops and the flavor of hops and how they contribute to beer, but I don't particularly get the final addition of hops. I mean, they say that's for aroma. Well, I don't go around with my nose stuck to my beer bottle you know, sniffing my beer. So I really, I really don't care what it smells like. Uh, I'm just wondering no. what purpose that serves, no. actually. Well, when you're when you're dealing with a carbonated beverage, and especially if you're drinking it from a mug, uh, you're going to have a lot more influence from aroma than you would with a still beverage. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So uh, you're you're picking up a lot more uh, aroma from beer than you would from, say, a wine or a mead. Well, and yeah, things do take. You know, it's funny how your sensories work. I mean. Things do taste better when you can smell them, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can influence your perception of it too. Uh, like in this instance, these uh, East Kent Goldings, they uh, they give uh, sort of a uh, an English ale uh, character to it. So uh, some people some people might refer to this as an English ale bracket. I called it an Irish ale because I used an Irish ale yeast, but with these East Kent Goldings, it, it you might even call it a, a an English ale, yeah. which is yeah. quite a bit different. So, yeah, they can influence for sure those those last additions. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, JD is one of the things I did to you know, prepare and do a little homework for, for some of our discussions about beer. I was looking at some pretty common, commonly used hop varieties and just kind of taking some notes on them to see what is that alpha acid percentage. Um, and what I've noticed is that in general, it seems like those, and, and this definitely stands to reason, the hops that have the higher levels of alpha percentage, so, you know, like, like, Je or, um, Chris mentioned he used the Chinook hops as the bittering hop. You know, the, the ones that have the higher levels tend to be used as the bittering hops, which are boiled for the full 60 minutes. Some of the other hops that are more in like that medium to low alpha acid percentage range are typically used more as, as the flavor and aroma hops now it's you know certainly not to say that you can't have certain hops that are more of like a dual purpose and can be used as both bittering and flavor and aroma as well um but just kind of an interesting trend that i'm seeing at least in these maybe 10 or 12 hop varieties that i was looking at yeah well and uh you know i'm actually thinking of something dark uh, I don't know. I just I've, I've got this dark braggot in mind. Uh, you know, using a using a dark malt extract instead of a light malt extract, going almost to the complete opposite direction that uh, that uh, Jeff was going with his. But um, you know, I think of like a chocolate. Uh, porter or a chocolate stout. That's what I'm would, thinking. I would would do a, uh, make a good one. Yeah, uh, that, that's good. You know, my I'm wife, thinking. my wife likes those uh, Guinness. Oh, uh, oh. yeah. I'm not a big fan of them, but she likes them. Uh, but I'm wife? thinking, yeah, I'm thinking something like you know toward that direction anyway. Uh, well, because you get that creaminess, and that creaminess is really going to uh, come into play when it when it starts to interact with the honey. See, that's where uh, now that's where I could take the creaminess in in a beer or whatever you want to call this we're putting together more so than that pumpkin. In in that pumpkin, it just it just. I don't know. It just it doesn't taste right. That creaminess just really it almost takes away from the overall uh, flavor of the beer, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, uh, 
in something like a chocolate porter uh, braggot thing we're talking about here, I could see where that would really play into a nice finish, uh, actually. Uh, yeah, playing with the chocolate and the honey, and then, you know, yeah. the natural creaminess that's going to be there. And then if you want to add even more, uh, you can carb it with uh, with nitrogen instead of CO2. And yeah. that'll that'll get an even more real fine, creamy head on it. So, Oh, yeah. Nitrogenated beers are so smooth. They are. They It's like night and day difference. And... Uh, uh, and it's it's worth the extra trouble. How do you come by one of those? I wonder. Uh, you just use a nitrogen tank instead of CO two. Well, I don't have. I don't. I'm not set up to do that. But can you buy that kind of stuff on? You know, I mean, can you buy a nitrogen carb beer at a liquor store? You can. I think Sam Adams right now has some different styles of beer that they're putting out that are nitrogenated. I want to say they've got like an IPA and, and some different things like that. So that might be something to look for. Yeah. I'm going to have to check with my guy down at BevMo and, uh, and see, um, because that's the other, I mean, I, you know, besides the $700 vacuum cleaner, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm faced with another dilemma too, because, uh, and uh, it's you know it's it's either I've, I've been looking I've been toying around with the idea of getting another fermenter, but this is going to be like the mother of all fermenters uh, in my collection. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking at a 14 gallon job, and uh, that's going to be a hard sell. Uh, you know, apparently it's, you know, probably going to be a lot harder than the $700 vacuum cleaner. But, uh, you know, it's either that or, and I've also been toying around with the idea of a kegerator. And I have compared the cost of just getting, an, a, you know, a small refrigerator and doing a conversion. Uh, and honestly, it's almost cheaper just to go out and buy a damn kegerator. And, uh, you know, with all the stuff, I mean, you know, minus the pony kegs, but those are a dime a dozen, pretty much. I can pick those up, you know, fairly cheaply at, at two of my homebrew places. So, you know, uh, so I'm not sure which direction I want to go with it yet, uh, because I, I, I really do want to get into this beer making, braggot making thing. And I need one fermenter to do that in. I, I really need something to do beer in. Uh, yeah, I would. I'd skip the uh, the fermenter and and invest some money in your in your kegging setup. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but, and get you a get you a, a good beer gun. Get you a, a Blickman uh, beer gun, and uh, get set up to do that correctly because. Yeah. When you get into it, you're going to start getting into these styles, especially with braggots, where you're going to have residual sweetness left. And the only way you're going to be able to do it is to force carve them. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're going to need that. And and I've got I've got some really good recipes for uh, um, for some hydromels that that are force carved. Uh, yeah. And the only way to do it is to have that little setup. And, and then it's, you'll spend less money, actually, than you would on that fermenter. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, and uh, besides that, the kegerator deal, the kegerator setup is something that my wife will will actually say yes to. Uh, because I, I swear, if she comes home and finds this giant fermenter, uh, sitting next to the twins, I mean, I, I might as well just lock myself in the bedroom for the next month or two. Uh, <laughs> Someone's going to be in the doghouse. Oh, yeah. But if you know. she's got a good cold, a good cold uh, oh, yeah. uh, spigot to, to, to pour out a good cold beer out of, yep, yep. she's going to be happy. 
Oh yeah, see, she she loves her beer. She loves her arrogant bastard beers. She loves her Guinness. Uh, she loves tans, uh, and uh, she loves her beer. So that's an easy sell. Uh, you know, uh, honey, look, we can make our own beer and have it right here on tap. That's a no brainer. Yeah. Uh, so JD, what you need to do is get the kegging system, get some nice draft beer in in her, and then she won't care if you get the fourteen gallon fermenter <laughs> after that. Yeah, but when <laughs> when she wakes up, there'll be hell to play. <laughs> so, yeah. I, it's easier it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So true story. Yeah, so, I mean, the twins, I mean, I told her that I was, you know, going to, I was going to invest in some winemaking equipment, and she kind of threw her eyeballs up into her head, and, you know, one of those moves, and I thought, okay, well, that means yes, right? So, I bought the first fermenter, and then I said, honey, this, you know, one is just not enough. I got to have two. And uh, so the second one was, you know, that was okay, too. But the third, I'm really pushing the limit here. So <laughs> besides that, man, and the 14-gallon the, the job was actually um, more, it, it was, it was going to be dual purpose because, you know, I, I kind of wanted to do what Chris does, get more into these mellow mills and stuff. And my first experience with, you know, putting raw product into a meat didn't go well and that was that pumpkin thing uh, you know the displacement of 27 pounds of, of pumpkin just you know you ju it just doesn't work in a 7 gallon fermenter so uh, yeah but here, here's JD you know I have to go through the same thing you do I have to justify but more so you know, I'm I'm a tightwad. I'm a miser, so I justify to myself these purchases. I don't justify them to to my wife or someone else. I have to talk myself into them. Okay, <laughs> so so when I start trying to justify, I look at my setup that I have, and I look at my five gallon plastic bucket from Home Depot, and I look at my I look at my fifteen gallon trash can from Home Depot, food grade, yeah. and I think I'm making really good mead right now with this. Why do I need that? And so I don't buy it. <laughs> so, I, thought, I thought you were going to go the other way and think, oh, gee, God, you poor slob using all this secondhand stuff. To make you could be using stainless steel. and. <laughs> well, see, but being a miser like I am, uh, I go the other way. Yeah. I think I can go spend another twenty-one bucks to get another fifteen-gallon trash can, food grade, and yeah. I'm I'm all set. I, I've got another fifteen-gallon batch going. So yeah, I kind of I kind of go the other way because I'm yeah. I'm so stingy and. Uh, uh, I don't like spending money. I don't get pleasure out of spending money. So when there's a cheaper way, uh, you know, you can bet I'm going to do it. That's just how I am. It's ingrained in me. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I could go out and buy 10 stainless steel fermenters today and, and have them delivered and on a flatbed truck and, and set up a, I just couldn't. I couldn't sleep at night if I did that. Remind me never to go to him for bypass surgery because I might wind up with rubber hose from an auto shop in my chest. <laughs> no, fuel line works really well. <laughs> matter of, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking about suggesting fuel line uh, to the FDA and see if I could get a trial started on that. There you go. Oh God. Oh my God! Oh uh, Christ! But seriously, uh, oh, wow. you know, I'm, I'm talking more for the people listening out there who may be thinking, "What do I have to have to make good meat? To make good braggots? To make good whatever?" Yeah. You need a food grade plastic container 
you do not have to go out and and buy stainless steel fermenters. Now, if you like shiny new things and you like having all the gizmos, if that makes you happy, then by all means do it. I am not trying to talk you out of it. I'm just saying uh, somewhere down the line, if you're if you're tied on funds, you're going to run into things that you really and truly do need. So for those people listening who say, I've got X amount of money to spend on this, uh, don't spend it on expensive fermenters and then later on realize, I need a kegging set up and I can't afford it. Uh, So go the cheap route with the things that work just fine, like the food-grade buckets, and then spend your money on a good kegging set up, on a good uh, counter-pressure filler of some kind, like a Blickman beer gun or something. Uh, spend your money where it counts. Uh, if you're if you're on a budget, because yeah. you can you can definitely make uh, uh, really good mead, wine, braggots, beer, whatever in a food grade bucket. Well, I better oh, not yeah. say beer because I don't know about beer, but uh, the others you can for sure. Well, beer, I mean, you know, it's a common practice to ferment beer in these plastic wide mouth, what do they call them, big mouth bubblers or whatever that uh, you see that are so common. But, uh, you know, even to keep them in secondary for, you know, a month uh, is not that big a deal. What you don't want to do is or a mead for, you know, a year and a half or a year. Uh, in them that just you know that's that's not a good idea but beer making i mean you're you know within a couple of months it's going to be in a bottle or a keg so uh you know if if even that uh probably probably not even a couple of months you're probably looking at maybe six to eight weeks maybe so well speaking speaking of aging i I don't i don't mean to change the subject here but uh i got an email it's free free for all it's free for all night so change it free for all night okay so uh i got an email uh you remember uh patty mackey who had called in um Mm -hmm. and she she emailed me asking me about this uh cherry melomel uh i had sent her the recipe and uh she was she was going to make it and uh so she emailed me and she was asking about how important is the temperature once primary is over. So we're going into secondary. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I assume that she meant maybe from secondary onward, even through aging. And uh, the way that I answered her is that I don't think temperature is quite as important once active fermentation is over. I'm not saying that it's not important. I think probably cellar temperatures are ideal, but it's honestly not feasible for me to do that, and probably the majority of home brewers, uh, it's not something that they can do very easily. So I wanted to um, throw that out there and get you guys' opinion on that, and anyone listening that wants to call and give their opinion when it comes to mead, now we're not talking about wine or beer. We're talking about mead. Yeah. Uh, how how important do you feel temperature control is after primary? Almost. Um, well, actually, actually, I think it's very important. Uh, and this is something that I picked up from uh, producing that other show. Of course, we had the we had. Uh, uh, Pete Bocklich, uh, uh the, the Ask Oscar section, session, and this question came up uh, at least a few times uh, that I know of, and his response was that, you know, temperature control is important all the way through, because the one thing that, that uh, you know, lower temperatures in aging does is help clear the wine. Uh, higher temperatures will just delay that for a period. Um, higher temperatures can also have an effect on the flavor as well, apparently. Uh, so cooler temperatures, if you can maintain a steady, not cool, I mean, we're not talking, uh, you know, something, you know, 50 degrees or, or, or colder, but 
you know, we're talking probably in the neighborhood of 65 degrees or cooler. Uh, it's the same thing as keeping wine, uh, you know, in a, in a cool environment. So, uh, but that's that's okay. That's what with, I, with that said, though, do you have the ability to keep yours at that temperature all the way through the aging process? Because I don't. Yes, I do. You do. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, yeah, that's this is going back to the DIY setup that uh, handles all of my chilling needs. Basically, uh, I have now. This is this only works if you are design. Your design is set up to handle. Okay, I have two immersion chillers. I can run two fermenters and cool two carboys, external carboys, at the same time and not change ice but once every five days. So uh, the two carboys are encompassed with or encircled with uh, 80 feet of 3 8 inch copper tubing. And they make contact with the carboy. And then around that is an insulated jacket uh, that uh, wraps around and keeps the copper nice and snug close to the carboy. Um, these are glass carboys, mind you, not plastic. Glass, uh, which is a good conductor of heat and, and cool. Uh, and then there's with a thermal well uh, that goes down inside. And both of them are hooked up to a digital controller and when the internal temperature reaches a certain degree, it turns the pump on and chills the carboy. Now, I have the capability of chilling both carboys to 55 degrees and keep it there constantly. But at that temperature, I'm changing ice about every three days. So, uh, so yeah, I do have the ability to chill... I keep my, my, my aging carboys are kept at 65 degrees, no matter what the internal, what the ambient temperature is in the house. They're kept at 65 degrees. So. Okay, well, 65 degrees is about the ambient temperature in my house all the time because I don't like it hot. I, I like to stay cool. Yeah. I do my best work when it's cool. I mean, for God's sake, I work in an OR, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know how cold those are. By God, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like it. Uh, I don't like it hot. So I keep I keep the thermostat cranked way down. So my ambient temperature is sixty five, sixty seven. You're you're uh, good. You're fine. Yeah. So when I when I do my primary, I, I really keep those temperatures down in the low end of whatever yeast I'm using, and normally it's 71B, but I, I keep them down toward the low end. But once primary is over, they go to room temperature, and I don't worry about them anymore. Uh, now, Patty and I were discussing this, and uh, we both have noticed something. Uh, being a mellow Mel guy, I tend to follow a lot of what Ken Schramm does because he's a he's big on the mellow mills as well. And she and I both had noticed that uh, if you go in his place, uh, his bar, there's uh, just carboys sitting everywhere with mead aging in them, and they're just sitting there at ambient temperature. So it's pretty obvious that he's not doing a lot of temperature control after primary either. So that kind of told me, well, it, it's okay. Uh, because I yeah. don't think there's anybody that's going to say that Ken's not making some good meat. So, uh, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think after, after primary, I don't think temperature really has that big of an effect. Uh, and I'm not saying that you can't store meat at a higher temperature. I think what Oscar uh, Pete was alluding to was the cooler, the better. Uh, yeah, but and, and I, I certainly agree. I think uh, cellar temperatures are ideal, yeah. but I don't think it's something to stress over if you can't maintain that all the no. time. No. 
No, not at all. Aaron, what, what's your uh, what's your take on it? Well, I'll tell you, even once it's in the bottle, I can be a little bit of a fanatic about it, too. Um, you know, I when we do traveling or we go visit people or even if we're just on vacation and, and we're transporting bottles of mead, you can ask my wife about it, and she just loves me for this. You know, if, if there's luggage and the dog and a cooler and all this stuff that needs to fit in the car, you would... She would probably prefer the need go in the trunk, but like I say, I'm just kind of a fanatic about it, and like that's going in the car, in the air conditioning to keep it at, at a nice temperature. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I definitely think there's something to it. I, I try to keep my needs when they're aging down in the basement at you know 65 degrees room room temperature, and uh, I, I think that's definitely a good practice as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's difficult to do in Mississippi. The uh, you can count on one hand the number of basements in Mississippi. Well, uh, yeah, and I mean you can go into I mean go to go to some place like Total Wine or a Bevmo where they've got hundreds of thousands of bottles of wine sitting on the shelf, uh, and the ambient temperature inside you know these places is probably seventy five degrees. Uh, you know, being the you know, power, uh, you know, conserving power and whatnot. And it's going to be between, say, 72 and 75 degrees inside some of these places. And this wine, you know some of this wine sits on the shelves for months and months and months. So, uh, and I think wine is probably more susceptible to temperature changes than probably mead would be, too. I don't know that for a fact, but... Uh, I know so my I... my uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're we're talking about different animals, and uh, yeah. of course, when you get into melomels, you may be stepping over that line a little bit further. But my my final answer to it is: if you can keep it cooler, keep it cooler. If you can't, don't stress over it. Yeah, uh, because I don't uh, honestly. You know when when. Uh, when your primary fermentation is over, uh, the meat itself is not going to be generating any more heat. So um, yeah. you don't have that to worry about. Uh, and that's one of the big things, I think, with temperature control is, is uh, trying to uh, control that, that heat that's generated from fermentation. Uh, but once that's over, I don't give it another thought, honestly. Uh, yeah. And I never have, and I don't know who's to say that if I did, I might, you know, it might turn out better. I don't know, but I've just never done that. So I say if you can keep it cool, keep it cool. If you can't, don't stress over it. Well, and if you're in a, you know, if you've got, if you've got any kind of forced air, air conditioning or whatever kind of air conditioning you might have in your home, uh, I did kind of a, a little experiment, uh, and uh, in my house, it is at eye level, the temperature is 70 degrees, anywhere from 70 to 72 degrees, pretty much all the time. In the summertime, it'll go up to about 74. However, at floor level, okay, the temperature is constantly 66 to 67 degrees and no higher. So, uh, you know, cold air sinks. And, you know, that pretty much tells you that, you know, keep your stuff on the ground. Don't put it up on shelves. Uh, you know, take advantage of that cold air that you might have in your house. Uh, if you don't have any other method of cooling or, you know, even during fermentation, uh, keep it on the ground. Don't put it up on a shelf or a rack or anything like that. Keep it on the ground. That's where the cooler air is going to be. So, yeah. And speaking of uh, speaking of coolers, I, I was just glancing at the uh, Facebook thing here. Patricia Gwen uh, Edwards, she's in the process of building one of these DIY chilling systems. You know that uh, that I built that we've been talking about for months now, and uh, she's uh, she's I guess uh, she's she's debating 
some kind of container and something for the for her chiller design. And I just want to mention the fact that uh, you know a simple Coleman cooler will do the trick. However, the most important thing that you have to put up with is the ambient temperatures because when the ambient temperatures rise, that brings the efficiency of your cooler down, uh, especially the Coleman coolers. Now it, it's the same thing. I've I've got a I invested, you know, here again, this was a, an expense that I had to, I, I had to work really hard at explaining why I needed a $300 cooler. <laughs> but this Pelican that I have, uh, it's two inches of insulation all the way around, and it has a, a sealed lid. In other words, it, it clamps shut, there's a rubber gasket that goes around it. And even on a warm day, if the temperature gets up to 74, 75 in the house, uh, even though it's setting on the ground, uh, I can go five days is the extent of it, okay, with the with uh, three systems running, with one fermenter and two chiller and two uh, carboy coolers. So keep that in mind. Uh you know, and well, I had to justify to myself getting getting a Yeti, uh, but I, <laughs> I finally cool. did. Those are I, good. I broke, good. Down and, I broke down and got the Yeti. That and, works. Uh, oh, it works really well. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, really absolutely. well. That's you know the if you're really serious about creating a, you know this DIY chiller system and and really want to get involved with it, that's the route that you should go. Uh, you know, you don't have to go that route. Now, there's a simpler way uh, to be able to maximize your efficiency, even with a Coleman cooler, and that's simply to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or, you know, uh, someplace like that and purchase refrigeration foam, uh, you know, get it a couple of inches thick, and, you know, get yourself a... Uh, you know, a, a, a saw, and cut your pieces to fit inside of a Coleman cooler, or figure out a way that you can wrap the Coleman cooler with it. Uh, you know, cut them to fit so that the Coleman cooler fits inside. That will help it immensely. Uh, you know, and you can pick that foam up. Uh, you know, relatively. But r remember, it, it's it's all about efficiency. Uh, if you don't want to keep, you know. And if you're buying ice, uh, you know, you don't want to have to keep buying ice every other day. Uh, that's how I started out. But, you know, realizing the fact that, you know, God, this is really getting old, uh, I started making my own block ice. Uh, and block ice will last a lot longer than cubed ice. And then when I went to the Pelican Cooler, I make my own block ice, and my little test one day, and I kept posting this stuff up on pace, on Facebook, I went seven days, okay, and the temperature never got above 40 in seven days, okay? Uh, so and it's, that's the internal t water temperature. I've got a little digital thermometer that uh, has a little probe that goes down into the water inside. So it's all about efficiency, uh, Patricia. Um, you know, uh, go to Home Depot, Lowe's, look around, see what you can find. You want to insulate your Coleman cooler uh, somehow. Uh, increase the efficiency of that alone will help uh, quite a bit. So anyway. Yeah, and this goes back to what I said a moment ago. If you're on a budget or if you're like me and you just hate spending money, uh this is where you spend your money. Uh, uh, you get a good way to control your temperatures, and, and get a good way to to bottle your finished product and and to keg your finished product. And that's where you spend your money on the things that count. Because the the container that you ferment in is not nearly as big a deal as the temperature that it stays at. So. Yeah. Uh, Think about these things and spend your money wisely. I'm, I'm still convinced there's some way I can take some of it with me when I go. 
so I'm not sure I don't like spending it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, you know, and I, I know how much those Yeti coolers cost, too, by the way. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and that hurt. That hurt my feelings <laughs> when I bought that. I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. It, oh. uh, you know, I looked at all the reviews, and uh, you get up into that bracket, and they're pretty much, I mean, for the purposes that we're using, uh, you know, some lasted five days, some would last seven days. If I could, I knew that my five days was my cutoff. If it was anything less than that, I wasn't interested. Anything more than that, and it had my vote. So there were two or three out there. Uh, that I was looking at. I settled on the Pelican only because I know Pelican. Uh, we carried all of our uh, all of our firearms uh, uh, were carted around in, in in the back of our vehicles in Pelican boxes. They're strong. Uh, hell, you could drop these things out on an airplane uh, and they'll stay together. So. I, I I thought you know what Pelican uh, that's a brand that I trust. And so I got it, and I've been completely happy. You know, I I ruined the, you know, I mean, within the first hour after it arrived, I already ruined the uh, the warranty on it because I was drilling holes in it. <laughs> so um, yeah, I know. And, and and just to give you an idea on this Yeti, uh, you said you paid seven hundred bucks for a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you about this Yeti. Uh, for what I paid for the Yeti cooler. It should vacuum, it should cool, it should cook, <laughs> clean, and it should mow the lawn. What size did you get? I got the big one. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, dude. Because uh, I was thinking about I was thinking about future expansion. If I ever get more yeah. fermenting buckets, uh, I don't want to be sitting there. I don't want to buy another one. That's for damn sure. Right. <laughs> so... So it was actually it was cheaper to buy the big one than to buy two smaller ones. So I said, let's go ahead and, and prepare for it now, and it'll handle it if I ever need it to. Tore me up. So, I had to take the drill to it. I'm thinking, oh my god, there goes my warranty. But then on the other hand, I mean, who need who needs a warranty for a cooler anyway? I mean, it's got to keep things I mean, cold. So. When I when I paid that much for that cooler and I drilled two holes in it, I had <laughs> diarrhea for like three days. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it just it just hurt my feelings so bad. But hey, you know it works. I've got uh, hell two holes. I've got eight, uh, nine. I've got ten holes in mine. Uh, yeah, well, I, I started out with two, and then when I if I decide to expand it, I'll have to drill more, but. You know, after that first one, the second one was easier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you're not going to lose any. If, you know, the, the holes, the plastic tubing that I used, uh, I used a half-inch drill bit, and the outside diameter of the tubing that I used to connect the 3 8 to was a perfect half-inch fit, so I'm not losing anything through the holes. Uh, the one large hole that the electric cords to the pumps had to go through was a little bit bigger, but I got some of that that uh, foam stuff in a in a uh, can. It's uh, I don't know what you call it for. You, know, you can put it in your walls if you want to. It's that expandable foam stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, I just sealed up the the big hole around the. Uh, uh, you know that I had to cut out for the electrical line, so I mean it's sealed. It's sealed tight. So mm -hmm. yeah. So this is a. Uh, uh, I got mine wrapped up like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I <laughs> I went overboard with uh, insulating all the the exits and entrance and and yeah. everything. Was I, I said uh, to hell with this? If I'm going to pay this much money for it, uh, I'm gonna. I mean, you could you could probably liquefy nitrogen in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that's that's how that's how important. Uh, like me, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I I spent a lot of money on my fermenters and my system and everything, but that's how important it is to me. 
Uh, yeah, we're going to have to stop talking about it because it's making me uncomfortable when I think <laughs> what I spent on it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, we yeah we we pretty much reached that point in the show. Uh, good good little chat tonight. Uh, you know, I kind of like this open end thing. Let's go around the horn real quickly here. Uh, the hopper list. Chris, might as well start with you. You got anything going? I just got this cherry uh, project that we've got going on the website, uh, and it's been racked uh, out of secondary off the cocoa, and it's sitting clearing. Uh, Nothing else so far, but I do have some things on deck. I've got, like I said last week, I got to get my uh, my sourwood going, and uh, I've got a couple other melomels I'm going to be working on. I think I'm going to try a few things different, so uh, yeah. get the game plan together over the next few days or weeks and uh, and then uh, get those I need to get those out of the way because we're going to be getting into fall pretty soon and that's going to be sizer season so yeah, uh, I got to get all this uh, routine stuff out of the way that I make every year so I can uh, jump on the sizers well you know and maybe in the next couple of shows we should uh, probably start thinking about talking about sizers that's uh you know, like you say that's coming up, and uh, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to get this braggot nailed down and and yeah. sort of approach it the same way we did the coffee experiment, and yep. uh, we'll we'll look at it as an experiment, and then uh, once we get that under our belt, we should be well into apple season by then, and yeah. uh, we can sort of do the same thing with sizers. We can try some different things. Yep, Aaron, what you got in the hopper list? Not too much different from last week. Uh, actually, I was just over in the other side of the basement peeking on my hopped meads, and they're definitely getting more and more clear, just about ready to bottle. Um, other than that, the, the coffee boche, still pretty cloudy. Uh, my my sweet, semi-sweet wildflower traditional, also fairly on the cloudy side um, starting to show some signs of clarifying though so right now just kind of playing the waiting game on some of these yeah well I've got uh, the peach thing going here it's kind of in its last uh, uh, few days here I haven't checked a hydrometer reading on it yet but uh, I think it's doing fairly well I keep a pretty close eye on it uh, this one's happened happened to be fermenting in a bucket on the floor. It's not in one of my fermenters uh, because of the displacement issue of all the, the fruit. Um, and I'm pretty happy with it so far. Uh, hoping that it's going to come out uh, the way I like and, uh, you know, anxious to, uh, uh, you know, to get that in the bottle and get it, you know, uh, be able to drink it. So besides that, uh, I don't have any other meads going. I'm waiting on some to clear. I've still got the sourwood deal. It's clearing, uh, not real quick, but it's it's kind of getting there. Uh, I dropped some Hungarian oak cubes in it. Uh, I'm hoping that's going to add a little little mouthfeel, a little, little extra something to it. I really like the way it tastes. Uh, really coming out good. Uh, various wines. I've got three reds and a, and a white wine, a uh, Chardonnay. Uh, working. In fact, I'll be putting together a Cabernet tonight with some blackberries and black currants. Um, and then this Braggot thing. Oh, I've got a beer. I actually have a porter. Uh, this is a kit that I did. It uh, came out of primary yesterday. It's in secondary, sitting on an ounce and a half of uh, dark roast coffee beans, whole beans. Uh, hoping to give it uh, just a hint of a little bit of coffee to it. That's my wife's beer. She loves that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to be looking at beer kits, guys, uh, over the next week, and I'm going to make my, my selection. I'll email you where and what uh, I'm going to pick up um, and... Uh, you know, see if we can't get this braggot thing off the ground. I'm, I'm really anxious in in doing uh, in doing this. Um, and, and Chris, you know, Bud, I, I really think I'm going to take you at your word. I, I think I'm going to head in the direction of the kegerator. 
Uh, I really, I really think that's where I want to go with this. Uh, I really, you know, like I need another fermenter, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, going to be so. It's a, like you said, it's so much easier to sell. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it so. is really. Uh, you know, because my wife, I mean, she, like I said, she loves her beer. Uh, uh, she's a real connoisseur when it comes to beer, and. Uh, uh, so uh, I know that would make her happy. So, but other than that, uh, good show, guys. Uh, might as well wrap it up here. Uh, hopefully, Jeff will be able to join us next week, next Tuesday night. You know, I don't even know how many shows we usually do. Six and off two, six and off two. I don't even know where we're at. Um, I think we got through. Uh about uh, maybe one more week or so, and yeah. we came back after Fourth of July. So, yeah, we had two, three. This is probably four. We got maybe two more shows. Yeah, let's. Uh, we'll probably get through this bracket thing. I want to get that off the ground and get it started. I'm going to put this recipe that Jeff sent us up on the website for a shot. Uh, and anybody who's listening to the show, if you do happen to copy the uh, recipe and get Keep us informed. Let us know how you're doing with it. Uh, you know, we'd like to hear from you. And, um, uh, you know, uh, at least, uh, you know, keep track of, uh, of how you're doing with it and uh, keep us filled in. So with that said, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and call it a night. Call back next Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, right here at the Mead House, themeadhouse.com. We'll see you then. <laughs>